So what does the world of grizzly bears look like now vis-a-vis uh, -vis current potential as well as some current acute threats? Insofar as potential goes, it's worth just looking at what the potential looked like uh, prior to European contact. Again, um, Troy and I did some modeling. Um, we estimated that this ecosystem probably contained around 360 grizzly bears prior to European contact. Um, the darker the green shading here, the higher the potential densities of grizzly bears back then. These results agree quite well with uh, results produced more recently by Mike Proctor. Um, he likewise modeled um, core habitat, again, with a focus on intrinsic habitat productivity, everything in dark green. He also modeled um, potential connective habitat in yellow. So again, a good coincidence, highlighting that the most productive habitat is on the western margins of the ecosystem, but also secondarily in the Cabinet Mountains. So here we have current core habitat, core, core uh, suitable habitat, if you will. We estimated then what would be the potential just restricting our focus to these areas. Uh, we came up with between 80 and 125 bears, and it was quite similar, remarkably similar, to Another estimate independently produced by Garth Moak, he focused on the recovery area as such. He came up with 130 bears, so suggesting that um, without changing a whole lot, other than perhaps um, how we manage some amount of human access as well as human lethality, we could probably have between 80 and 100, 130 grizzlies in this ecosystem in contrast to the 45 uh, roughly that we have now. So with that in mind, as sort of a background then, looking at threats, it makes no sense to make matters worse to these populations that are already in such a precarious plight. For example, build the proposed Rock Creek mine here, the footprint for that mine in shades of lavender in the very heart of the Cabinet Mountains, already acutely vulnerable. And of course, all of the people that would work in those mines or the increased numbers of people that would work in that mine would end up residing probably along the Highway 200 corridor, which already is a uh, fracture zone that is a major impediment to recovery of bears um, on both sides of it. Nor does it make any sense to build the proposed Pacific Northwest Trail, as is proposed right now, through the heart of some of the best core grizzly bear habitat in the Yak ecosystem. Basically, moving ahead with these proposals is tantamount to a mortal knife thrust into the bowels of these two acutely vulnerable populations in the Yak and in the Cabinet Mountain. Also, an ongoing persisting threat has to do with these fracture zones with a focus on the Cabinet Mountains, um, the most isolated of these two populations. Here again, these fracture zones. Um, the record of movement so far of bears into the Yak that uh, bears that moved and died, in this case, uh, four different males, one different females. So although they got across the fracture zone, all of these into the yak, one of them into the cabinets, they ended up dead. But there were also a certain number of bears that have managed to move across, in this case, all males and survive. So three males moving between the cabinets and other uh, ecosystems. And finally, one lone female that was able to move into the yak and actually reproduce. But not a very good track record over a 12 year period of time. What it amounts to for the cabinets is one surviving male moving into this um, population every four years, none of them transmitting their genes. So not very auspicious and highlighting again that the threat of fracturing and fragmentation remains acute. What about the future? 
it's certainly not going to be any better than the present by virtue of changes in foods and numbers of people. One of the main drivers of deleterious change is going to be climate warming. And we know it's going to be a lot warmer in the future than it is now, emblematic of that. Apropos of that, here for the Northern Continental Divide, you have um, average minimum temperatures for the 1980s projected out through the 2080s. Um, as you might guess, uh, increasing shades of red uh, denote increasingly warm minimum temperatures. It's going to be hotter. It's almost certainly going to be drier as well because of increasing drought conditions with implications for important foods. Emblematic of this, for berries, I had a graduate student project out what would likely happen with important shrub, uh, berry producing shrubs looking just a mere 50 years out. Here for buffalo berry, everything in orange is where we're likely to lose buffalo berry. Green is where it's likely to persist. Uh, you can see the various grizzly bear ecosystems, uh, the cabinet yak up there straddling the Idaho-Montana border. Um, by this projection, buffalo berry is essentially going to disappear in this ecosystem and be much dimish, diminished throughout the northern Rockies. Even more catastrophic losses for choke cherry, almost gone, um, gone almost altogether from the grizzly bear ecosystems in the northern Rockies. Similarly for service berry, much, much diminished. The least bad prognosis is for huckleberry. Um, by this model, anyway, we would expect huckleberry to be hanging on in substantial areas in the northern continental divide, Cabinet Yak, and Selkirks. But notably, we may have shrubs, but without pollinators, as you all know, we won't have berries. And the prognosis for pollinators is not that bright, um, perhaps even bleak. So you put all this together, and almost certainly, there are going to be many, many fewer berries in the future compared to now for grizzly bears to eat. So the closest analog we have is the berry famine from 1998 to 2010, basically the onset of a berry famine that never ends. And there's going to be a lot more people. So each one of these red dots represents a human residence as of 2005. Here, six years hence, there already are a lot more of us. There are going to be even more of us yet looking into the near future. 